Now we'll visit the garden training project for which we came. This is Nansana, a government-owned facility. At the beginning of the project, ten men spent a week clearing a forest of trees, shrubs, and weeds from this parcel. Finally, the outline of the garden is defined and the last of the tree stumps are removed. And now it looks like it could become a garden. Manda, my translator for the three-month course, gets help staking the first beds. Every training project begins with a 20 by 40 foot or 6 by 12 meter seedling greenhouse. Four by four posts are placed at 10 foot intervals and buried 18 inches deep. Four by four top stringers tie everything together and give it strength. Two by four studs finish the sides and roof trusses complete the structure. We use inexpensive clean rice hulls, sawdust, and sand to grow our seedlings. We grew 10,000 plants at a time on tables inside and 10,000 more on hardening off tables outside. Before we could even complete the greenhouse, we were planting and transplanting on the tables. Students worked in the greenhouse almost every day. Leonardo spoke pretty good English. Jose is another among six in the class who spoke English. And Norson understood some, but lacked confidence to speak it. Jose says he will export the sweet potatoes to the USA, so you can taste it. We taught propagation with taro and sweet potato cuttings. The six mil greenhouse plastic was secured with lath and provided protection against weather and pests. Elder Stephen Flanagan built the two sturdy doors. Erison was the foreman in the garden and preparing to replace me as the teacher. Continuous ventilators at the roof and sides run the length of the greenhouse and keep it cool. Felix is the leader of a small village about 40 miles away. He and his brothers hope to build their own greenhouse soon. And Fidi has had experience growing and selling tomatoes already. He owns the only car in the class as a result. A storage shed is being built to protect tools and materials from weather and theft. They mix their concrete in place using shovels. This is slow and difficult. And notice the hammer and trowel. But they finished it. They walk a quarter of a mile to haul their drinking water, and it's not clean enough for us Americans to drink without getting sick. With Elder Flanagan directing the building of the storage shed, it came together quite fast. These men are happy to work hard for a dollar a day. Lumber is typically delivered in a two-wheel cart pulled by young men like these. With this siding, we're hopeful it will withstand the typhoons that blow fiercely across the island. Several young men prepared three wells to supply water for the one-acre garden. They placed three-foot diameter cement pipes over the hole, then dug around and beneath them until they settled. This well was 18 feet deep when completed. This older well just needed cleaning out. We plumbed all three wells together so a single pump could either water the garden or fill the storage tank. And to show how fast watering can be done, an automated system was built for 39 of the 250 soil beds. The 29 students spent two hours in the classroom and five hours in the garden. Andre, who spoke pretty good English, makes a point the first day. During the first day in the garden, the students learned how to build and level the soil beds. Nina still worked when others were going home. Ernesta also worked hard. Norson gives him a hand here. Mamtina is a college graduate in agronomy and a quiet leader. 
The project included three separate areas divided by important drainage ditches. In just the second week, Honoré and other students started preparing the middle area for planting, while others dug drainage on the west so summer rains don't flood us. With T-frames, we'll grow tomatoes vertically. These men are completing the beds in the second area. And now a few students are preparing the third area for planting. Lucy is one of four very bright and hard-working women in the class. Ederson waters alone on a beautiful late afternoon. Just four weeks into the project, the students do weeding and cleanup. And in just two more weeks, we see significant changes, with good growth everywhere. Measurable changes come very fast now. Those are young bush beans, and the pole beans are just starting to climb. The zucchini is already producing only three weeks after transplanting. And tomatoes are almost waist high. Seedling flats were watered daily. The students also built and installed many tea frames for the climbing and vining plants. One day, Lucy brought her husband and three children to see what she was learning. The garden was such a beautiful place, especially when the trees were in blossom. Everything grew quickly, and visitors were impressed. Less than six weeks after transplanting, we began to see ripe tomatoes, while pruning and guiding up the strings continued daily. Already the squash plants are growing across the aisles and starting to crowd each other. We'll do some pruning soon. This is a climbing squash. The lettuce is ready to harvest. The pole beans are already over six feet tall. And the corn is tasseling. I told the students the bird you hear in the background is saying, work, work, work. We had a hailstorm a couple of nights ago, and while the plants came through it, there are some holes in the leaves. The bush beans are starting to produce. Mino and Ernesta transplant green onions. Jean Marcelin, Baronsoa, and Leonide hear the birds say, work, 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 as they put in more tea frames. Tomatoes are an important crop everywhere. Eulalie is remarkable. She lived comfortably in France for 20 years, but returned home recently to rescue her family property from squatters. And Ernesta is the smallest in size, but has the biggest heart of all. Fetra and Johnny are training peppers to climb, the same as we do tomatoes. I discovered that Nina, his sister-in-law, and his aunt teach 73 village children in one room of their home. Flaubert followed Erison to become the teacher of several subsequent classes. We bought native materials for tea frames to help students get started growing their own tomatoes. We were visited several times by the government director of agronomy in the suit. Mr. Edmund, who's the president of Mad Aid, is in the blue and black coat. The Flanagans represented the LDS Church as country directors for humanitarian services. The agronomy director seemed to be impressed and excited with our progress. Lucy is explaining how we're able to grow so much food in a small area. On this visit, the director of agronomy asked Mr. Edmund if we would do projects all over the country, and he was not dressed so formally this time. The LDS Church Humanitarian Services Department asked their church leader for Southern Africa, Robert Oakes, to inspect the project as well. 
He took the time to meet all of the students and ask their opinions as to how they liked it and what they were learning. We like to dig a well every day, toujours. As part of the classroom study, every week we had quizzes. Johnny, who speaks quite good English, gave Manda a break by reading the test questions. Shortly after the beginning of the project, I began spending late afternoons and evenings working with individual students, building or improving their own gardens. Living in the city, Momtina didn't have much space, so we're helping her create a small garden of lettuce and tomatoes. Some students had even less space than this for their gardens. Nina's family farm is only 10 miles from the city, but bad roads make it an hour's drive. As you can see, they're very serious farmers, and they've provided a small section for Nina to show his stuff. His brothers take care of the farm while Nina is in the agriculture class. He wants to use this three-quarter hectare parcel for his own Mitleider garden after graduation. Elaine's family also has a large farm. His nephew and nieces almost never see foreigners. His brothers are doing a good job of taking care of the family farm with beans and corn on the edges of these beds of onions. We're a ways up the hillside, but there is a small spring, so they prepared this spot for Elaine to demonstrate what he's learned. Mino and her husband enjoyed a degree of prosperity until a few months ago when the African swine disease wiped out their herd of 45 pigs. And then their wells dried up. Now they're struggling. Once again, we have to walk a long distance to arrive at their vegetable gardens. Mino's family did a good job of preparing the ground, so we were able to come, build the beds, and plant several flats of vegetables. This is a typical water source. They'll haul their water with buckets or sprinkling cans. Mino's husband got excited about what we were doing. A few weeks later, we returned to Mino's and saw that things were growing well. We then planted quite a few more beds, primarily with tomatoes. How about that rake? These tomatoes were transplanted previously. On this afternoon, we visited Honoré's ancestral home in the city. It was built by his great-grandfather, but is in a sad state of disrepair and decay because of the bad economic conditions. Honoré's son and daughter are working with him today. They have to lift every bucket of water from a depth of 50 feet, or 15 meters. A few days later, we visited Honoré's home, about 25 kilometers or 15 miles from the city. He and his family are building an orphanage at the top of one of the highest hills in the vicinity. The buildings will house 35 to 40 orphans. It was hard to visualize where they could plant very much. However, we'll see this ground become flat, level, and a highly productive garden. We returned later with good news for Honoré's family. An LDS church grant will fund a cow, chickens, and six months' feed, a windmill, well, barn, chicken coop, greenhouse, and gardening supplies, all to help them get their orphanage off to a proper start. Regia lived in the city on over half an acre. It was quite an adventure finding his place through the narrow, crowded streets. As usual, a well is the water source. He's one of our best students and has a wife and two children. A short time later, Rija expanded his garden substantially. Fidi, the one with experience growing tomatoes, surprised me with this unique tomato garden. It has a very sophisticated watering system, which must have required several people to help him create. A good group of students came to help him plant today and had a great time. Flaubert was just finishing up his university studies and lives in student housing, so his garden is very tiny and sits right next to a garbage pile. It's pretty bad. 
He's student poor, but very smart and hard working. We planted six short beds. Lucy took us to the new home they're building and the garden they have there. In the background, you see dirt that's almost white. It's very high in lime content. She's thanking me for the work that I'm doing to help them. Very few Americans visit Madagascar. Eulalie is truly unique. Giving up her comfortable life in France to save the family inheritance from squatters, she returned to discover a typhoon had destroyed her parents' home. These are other extended family members' and villagers' homes. As with other large farms, we had to walk a great distance to get to the garden. They need readily available water since we teach students to water often. These folks usually just plant a large area and hope for rains to come so they can get a little something. We planted 26 beds. At lunchtime, dinner was served to all who came to help. Their meals consist of 90% rice and vegetables and 10% meat if they're lucky. As we ate, we saw a man digging up the mountainside and planting manioc, a root crop. This is the main cause of the terrible erosion they have in this country. If he would plant one-tenth as much near water, then feed and care for it, he would harvest much more and healthier food. Later, Eulalie showed us the reservoir she just built to capture water from a natural spring about 900 meters or half a mile from her home and village. She paid for this, plus the piping to carry the water to the village. Villagers provided labor, for which they will soon be getting clean water for the first time ever. Felix and his family property were next. He's done a good job of growing many beds of tomatoes and other vegetables, even using tea frames, although these won't hold much weight. After transplanting several beds, we cleared and staked this spot for a 6 by 12 meter greenhouse and then returned to the home where the yard was shared with pigs and chickens. Supper was being cooked in a small building just off the kitchen, in efficient-looking charcoal stoves. And the children were fascinated by the foreigner and his camera, as usual. Next, we visited Jacques, who is an agronomy department employee. His property was a long distance from Tana. His wife and daughter came to meet us. The only place they had for a garden was almost a half-hour walk from their home. They had been growing sweet potatoes for the past year, but because they had not watered them much nor fed them, they were tiny. We transplanted taro that Jacques grew in the project's greenhouse. Jacques loved the two-way hoe, which was a gift from the foundation. Berenzoa is our last garden visit. He's just finishing a college degree in hydrogeology. His family is helping us today, and they'll care for the garden since Bari is staying in the city. Each week I would give a prize to one or two students chosen by their classmates as the most deserving during that week. The prize was an American $2 bill. This became something they really looked forward to and were proud of receiving. We also had a contest as to who could make and level a soil bed the quickest. And Flaubert, who was one of the smaller people in the class, was the best in the garden. I continued to give them tools and materials for their own gardens, and they were very appreciative. We also taught the students about marketing to make sure they weren't just learning how to grow food, but also how to sell both seedling plants and their produce. 
and so we took Lucy, Andre, and others out into the villages to sell tomato plants. They had fun and did a good job. We even placed a flat of tomato seedlings with a village nursery. During the last month of the project, we took a field trip to Ansira Bay, a city south of Tana, to see what others were doing. Reported to be the best agriculture school in Madagascar, the Lutheran Tombasu Agricultural Academy accepts about 50 young people, and for their last year of high school, they live on this campus full-time, learning how to grow food. The teacher took us out into their garden and began telling us about how great it was. Our students were shocked and embarrassed for these young people as they saw what they were learning. Since by this time our garden was big and lush and our climbing plants were seven and eight feet tall. They use only manure to feed their crops and when the teacher was asked what he thought of manure, he responded that it is perfect. So this represents their gardening efforts. Here's their strawberry patch, and this is their lettuce patch. Our students really appreciated having a productive garden by the time they left this place. After dinner, while waiting for the bus to take everyone to our lodging for the night, Jose led out in a spontaneous sing-in. They were a happy bunch. <laughs> The next morning, we visited a limestone crushing plant. I had told the students that fertilizer is mostly just ground up rocks. But they had no personal experience with that concept, and so this was an eye opening event to see that the material we'd been putting on the garden in the pre-plant mix actually was just ground up rocks. We also visited a government agricultural experiment station in which the authorities were trying to learn ways to improve crops and help the farmers. They have some pretty nice facilities. This is actually in a trailer, but it is climate controlled. They were talking about no-till farming, but then proceeded to show us all their tractors and equipment. And this is the best garden they could show us. With no water and no food, the taro was doing poorly, which the students duly noted. The formal graduation ceremonies were attended by the Secretary General of the Ministry of Agriculture with three of his department directors. They had high praise for what the students learned and accomplished and are interested in having us do projects in other parts of the country. The graduation ceremony was conducted outdoors near the garden project. Twenty-nine wonderful, hard-working students had just invested three months learning and practicing the principles of high-yield food production. The top ten in the class in the weekly quizzes and the final exam received special recognition. Felix and Momtina shared valedictorian honors. And Jacques earned the highest score on the final exam. He scored 98% on a 275-question closed-book exam. Watching the students celebrate their graduation made me appreciate what they've accomplished. And four million other families in this beautiful land deserve a chance to improve their lives as well. Those first students are paying forward the knowledge and materials we gave them. Examples are Rija and Johnny, who are teaching and assisting 70 women in this poor village. And Honoré, who is feeding orphans from his beautiful garden. But what is really needed is a permanent training program or school in order to bless the whole country 
as has been done in places as diverse and far-flung as Russia, Trinidad, and Papua New Guinea. Thank you.